Um, my name's Sarah Wesnick. Um, I'm an Australian optometrist and I am currently living in the UK and um, I've been working, sorry, I've been working with Orbis uh, teaching optometry um, since uh, 2016. So it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you guys again today. Um, today I wanted to speak about our role uh, in low vision beyond uh, the exam room and beyond just prescribing visual aids. Uh, too often I see a patient who is all set up with the visual aids that they could need. They've got the best visual acuity and the best vision, visual field they can get, um, but they're still walking out of the clinic no better off functionally and no more confidently than when they arrived. As clinicians, we get super excited and carried away with the diagnosis of disease and the mapping of visual space and the prescribing of telescopes, magnifiers and prisms. Uh, but we really fail to guide our patients sometimes on how to adapt their environment to suit their vision. We may have improved visual acuity and we may have improved the extent of the visual field, but we've really failed to provide the patient with functional vision, which I think um, a lot of the time the patient is disappointed, but is a little bit uh, concerned, a bit worried to say. So that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, before I start today's lecture, I received a lot of really interesting questions, fantastic ones actually. Um, today's lecture won't address uh, some of those questions. Um, however, we will be working to answer them e either privately, so either myself or some of my colleagues will um, answer them uh, privately, or um, we'll, we'll also work with the CyberSight team to perhaps uh, present some lectures that uh, more specifically address some of these questions, such as prescribing prisms. Um, I also had a few questions about setting up your own low vision clinic, which I think is a fantastic um, uh, webinar to present. So um, I'll have a chat to some colleagues and a chat to the team and see if we can set up something like that um, in uh, webinars to come. I also received um, a lot of questions that were specific um, for patient cases that you're seeing. Um, and I want to encourage uh, those who have questions like that, either ones that you sent or you, you have questions that you're thinking, oh, I really like to ask someone for some more advice on this. Um, anyone who had specific patient cases, I'd really like you to join our online learning community. So uh, I know you all um, signed up to the live uh, webinar uh, most likely going through this website. This is www.cybersite.org. You'll see on the top corner here, it says um, join us. And if you click that, this screen here will come up. You can pop in your name, your details, and make sure you click online courses and expert advice. Once we set you up, you'll log in like through here like this. Um, and your um, uh, screen will look something like this. This is me logging in this morning. Um, you can click start a new click case. You can see that there are several cases that were um, started only um, a few minutes ago or a few hours ago. People responding to private cases, to general questions. Uh, you can click uh, start a new case here or down the bottom. Um, and you'll see you can click select a subspecialty, so low vision, optometry, um, pediatrics. You can put in your patient information, age, uh, their visual acuity. Really, when you're um, creating new patient cases, the more information you can give the clinician that you want to um, speak to, the better. So jam pack this with information. Um, and either if it's a, a general patient case open to the public, someone might generally answer it. Or if you specifically ask for someone, um, then they will answer you back. They might ask for more information um, before they answer the case. Um, and then you can have a little bit of a dialogue about that particular patient. Um, you can also create a general, uh, a general question. So if you have just something like, does anyone know how to prescribe prisms in a particular disease? And you can, you can send that question out or that general question out. Um, and either again, a specific mentor, if you assign them can answer it or someone from the community might answer it. Um, so yeah, I just really want you uh, to get you guys involved as much as uh, we possibly can. Um, we love to hear about patient cases that you're seeing and the more um, cases that you send through, really, the better. 
Um, so I'm going to start um, by asking you to avoid the phrase, there's nothing more I can do, because there's actually a lot more we can do by providing our patients advice on how to use their vision and how to empower them and empower them in using their vision um, in their own environment. There's really the, the amount of advice that we can give to them is, um, is endless. These are just a few uh, resources that I think are really helpful in thinking about um, how patients can navigate their environment if they have low vision. Uh, additionally, I'd like to just take a moment to especially thank uh, Drs. Alexis Melkin and Nicole Ross and Mr. Derek Wright from the New England College of Optometry who helped put, uh, me put this lecture together a few years ago actually um, to share with you all this community. Uh, really, the low vision team at the New England College of Optometry is truly remarkable. Okay, so our objectives for the next uh, hour or so, a little bit less than an hour. Um, first, we wanna utilize our patient history to make appropriate recommendations. So listening to the patient, so we're making the, uh, we're giving the advice that is uh, specific to their visual um, needs. Discuss um, the activities in daily living that become difficult with low vision. Often we take for granted things like uh, drinking out of a cup or filling up the kettle, uh, those things seem pretty easy and pretty standard, um, but we don't think about actually how difficult they are um, for someone with low vision. Um, I'd like to equip you with some ideas and helpful hints to help people navigate their visual environment better. Uh, this is a huge undertaking, I guess, if you're gonna sit down and, and, and take a patient through all the things that they can do um, within their home. So um, often I'll uh, give a handout that has all of the things that we're going to discuss today uh, written down and with advice on there. So you can have a small discussion about each thing and then when they get home with their, their loved ones and their family and friends and their main carers, they can discuss how they're going to adapt their own home. Um, and I just also want to quickly um, teach you the technique of guiding a low vision person and also uh, how to teach the, their caregivers this skill um, and also how to um, help them explore their environment. So first, let's look at utilising the case history um, so we can make appropriate recommendations. When we're treating patients with a reduction in vision, it's particularly important to ask extra questions on top of our usual uh, case history. Um, and these questions are about how they're coping with their visual impairment and what daily activities they'd like to do better. And also how they're coping uh, with their visual aids. Just because you've given them a telescope doesn't mean that they're taking it out with them. Um, it doesn't mean that they're using it properly and it doesn't mean they're using it to the, its, its full potential. Um, please note in this slide, and when I'm talking about um, people with low vision, I'm emphasizing them. Often people come in and we're all guns blazing. We think we know what you want. We think you know we know what you're experiencing. Um, and it's actually really important to listen to what the patient wants and what the patient needs. The number of times I hear from patients, oh, I feel like this is the first time I've been listened to is outstanding. So make sure you're listening to what they're asking you. So uh, during our low vision exam, we're going to obtain information about all of these um, areas of reading speed, visual acuity, at distance and at near, the extent of their visual field, uh, their confidence in using their vision, um, if they have any contrast restrictions, how well they can move about their environment. Um, with a lot of these things, you can also just observe yourself. How confident are they in using their vision um, and moving um, from the waiting room into your exam room and sitting down in the chair and, and how, um, how are they managing that? Who are they with? Um, and how is that person helping them? If you want more information on how to conduct a low vision examination, there are um, on the CyberSight website, that's www.cybersight.org. There are on the CyberSight website um, a few uh, webinars from a few years back uh, that focus on the low vision exam and also focuses on low vision devices that you can use. That's both um, technology like our phones and computers, but also um, looking at magnifiers and telescopes. So now we have all of this information from our exam. We want to know how this applies to the patient's real life. So first try integrating some of the following questions into your case history, right? Get to know the patient. 
what can't you do anymore because of your vision? What are you wanting help with? How has your life changed since you lost your vision? They might say, well, I was a marathon runner. I, I did the uh, Boston Marathon, the New York Marathon, and, and now I, I haven't been running since I lost my vision. Uh, are they living alone? Are they living with family? Um, if they are living at home, have they made changes to their home environment or is everything still exactly the same? So have they um, made changes uh, to help them get about a little bit easier or haven't they really altered much at all? When it comes to reading, uh, we want to think about their goals and their needs. Um, but now that they have their visual aids, you've already prescribed them, um, ask how, how they're reading at the moment. What are they reading? How difficult is it? Uh, if they could expand their reading, if they could do anything, what, what would they want to do? Do they want to read books, letters, um, bills? They say, look, I'm okay with reading, but I'm having trouble really looking at photos of my grandkids. Um, do they want to go shopping independently? Perhaps at home they're reading okay, but they'd really like to go shopping independently and read the price tag or the, or the packet when they're at the supermarket. Um, also ask if they have tablets or computers um, and if so, if they're using them with their vision, we're not going to really cover this um, on how they can, although we will like very briefly, but how they can use these devices. But if, they, uh, if they're not using them, why? Um, perhaps they just, they're just not for that and, or perhaps they can't afford them and that's also fine. But perhaps they do have one stuck in a drawer or their grandkids have replaced their old one and, and they're happy to give grandma or grandpa their, uh, their, their old um, tablet, then um, teach them how to use that or get their kids to teach them how to use that. You also want to know if they're experiencing a lot of glare. So we, um, in our exam, we have a look at contrast, um, which is really important, but we want to ask in our um, case history if they're experiencing glare. And particularly important when we're thinking about um, going from outside to inside or inside to outside. You can imagine if you were going uh, shopping and every time you went from inside the supermarket to outside, um, you had to stop for a moment. There was a lot of noise, a lot of people walking around, a lot happening, and all of a sudden you feel blinded by the situation um, and you have to just sort of wait and to, and until your vision adapts. You can understand that would be incredibly um, confronting. Ask about TV. TV is often something that people really enjoy, um, but they're not really um, using uh, their TV anymore. Um, if they do enjoy TV, are they listening to it? Are they watching it? Is things as simple as, is the TV set up so they can view the screen? Um, is it set up in the right position of the room compared to their chair? Is uh, the screen too bright for them to really view um, properly? Or is it perhaps even positioned towards a window and so they're getting a lot of glare from the, um, from the outside light and so they can't really see what's happening on the TV. You also want to know, uh, can the patient identify familiar faces, um, particularly in crowds? Uh, you can imagine um, that when uh, they're at home, yeah, sure, they can identify somebody who's just walked into the room that's familiar, but when they're outside and they're walking with that person and suddenly they let go, then um, can they identify that person again? Because um, you can imagine that would be incredibly confronting. You also want to ask about how they're getting around. Are they dependent on someone else in order to get from one place to another? Uh, do they venture outside the house very often? And if they do, do they do it um, by themselves or do they do it with assistance? Uh, can they use a cane? Do they have a guide dog? Um, do they use a, a guide, a family member or a loved one um, to help them guide them as they're walking outside? And if they're not using these things, why not? What, why are they feeling that they can't um, use these things or they don't want to use these things? And would they like to travel more independently outside if they could? Um, a lot of people are quite happy not to, um, but a lot of people would say, oh, you know what? I wouldn't mind just going down to the corner store by myself. I think that would be okay, except um, how I'm set up right now, I, I, can't, I can't manage it. We also wanna ask about the tasks that they're having trouble with um, 
every day. And it's always good to be specific, to give them ideas about what might be difficult. Often patients have just accepted, I just can't do that anymore. So you say, are you having any troubles with the things that you do on a daily basis? And they go, oh no. Then you might say, um, do you cook anymore? And they say, oh no, I, I absolutely don't cook. Um, can you fill a cup by yourself? Oh, absolutely not. So they are having difficulties doing those daily tasks. So give them some ideas and ask some specific questions um, so you can get a better idea of what they are doing independently um, and what they require someone else to, to help them out with. Think about like all the things that we do on a daily basis um, even, and we really do take those things for granted, like um, drinking, um, eating from a plate, rather than a bowl, uh, filling a cup up um, with water from the kettle or from the tap uh, without spilling it everywhere, without it overflowing, um, putting on makeup or shaving uh, in the morning. Uh, cooking is an obvious one that a lot of patients uh, do give up. Um, taking the correct medications, if you take multiple medications uh, each morning, uh, we really do take for granted that I can read the back of the, of the bottle and I know which one to take and which one not to. Uh, getting dressed in the morning and uh, also choosing your own clothes to get dressed. Um, we really do sort of take that for granted. Um, when you're uh, washing and bathing, picking up the shampoo rather than the soap or the conditioner um, to wash your hair. Cleaning the house, being able to see the dust and the dirt, um, vacuuming, being able to vacuum um, if you wanted to. I, I hate vacuuming, so I'm not sure why anyone would want to vacuum, but um, doing the vacuuming. Um, also putting on the dishwasher or washing the dishes when everyone's in the kitchen helping out. Can you wash the dishes anymore? Can you help dry? Can you um, put things away? These are all really, um, they're activities that really with just a small amount of advice and maybe a small number of adaptations um, in the house that patients can really do these things independently in a lot of cases. Listen to what your patient is saying. So we're already saying, we're already saying listen to uh, what their needs and what their wants are rather than imposing our own um, onto them. But also listen about the about what they're saying. Do these complaints correspond with their visual field restrictions? Because they usually, or they should, they should do. So if someone says, I can see stairs going up, but not stairs going down. This suggests a, an inferior visual field defect. So we can already anticipate things that they might be having trouble with, with an inferior visual field defect. I bump into doorways on my right. Does this correspond to a right visual field defect that they're, that they're having? So think about what they're saying and how that relates. During this consultation, you will hear a lot of um, unrealistic requests, like I want to restore my vision to what it was before the accident, before the macular degeneration, um, what surgery can bring my vision back. Uh, it's only natural that patients um, will want to ask these questions. Uh, it's important to be honest, um, but it's also important to be kind in your response um, and understand that um, this is really what the patient would like to do is to go back to uh, what it was like beforehand. But it's really your job to help them realize that even though their vision won't be restored fully to what it was, that you can help them get back to the things that they were doing before they lost their vision. Um, we may not be able to achieve all their goals. There are just some goals that um, just aren't possible with the vision that they have. Um, and so let your patient know you will try to help them achieve their goals and to make them as independent as possible, um, but try and work with sort of one goal um, at a time. Um, be clear that things may not be performed the way they were prior, prior to losing their vision. Um, I'm going to introduce a lot of ways here to get around, um, for example, filling up a cup without it overflowing. There's going to be some things that are involved or some tricks that are involved um, to help them do that activity. And so the activity itself won't be exactly this performed exactly the same. And so there will be a lot of adaptations. It's also um, 
really important to manage the expectations of the main caregiver and the family um, and friends, but particularly the main caregiver, be really respectful when approaching um, this kind of discussion. Often people have been caring for their loved one with low vision for a really long time. So be mindful that this is most likely the caregiver's full-time job. Um, and often they're gonna feel redundant and possibly resistant to change. Um, even though from your point of view, you're thinking, but this would be great. It would make um, them more independent and, then, and thus you more independent. Um, but if you're not involving the main caregiver in the changes that are being made, um, then you might get a little bit of resistance from them. And so just be really respectful and really mindful um, that this is uh, affecting their lives too. And these changes will be affecting their lives too. And you'll be relying on the main caregiver to give uh, a lot of, uh, to implement a lot of this advice. Lastly, um, it's always really good to ask your um, patient and their family if they have any thoughts on what might make their vision worse. Because um, often you can debunk uh, any untrue old wives tales or concerns such as, um, Oh, I don't like to go outside because I, I know the sun will make my vision worse, which um, obviously is not the case. Um, so you can talk them through about how culturally that's just a, an old wives tale and it's not true or why it's not true or why it feels that way, but it's not true. Um, often uh, something I hear is if I wear my glasses too often, my vision will get worse. So you want them to really um, open up and tell you about the concerns that they're having don't try not to laugh at them or, or make fun of them. Be really, really caring and kind. This is, um, they're in a really vulnerable position and they're being really honest with you. Um, so try not to um, say, no, you're wrong or that's not correct, um, but just to talk them through and show that this is actually uh, not, not the case. Also, just very um, quickly, whilst we're getting to know our patients, I just want to touch on identifying psychological needs. Um, it's very important to be aware that both the caregiver and the patient are grieving their independence and the patient is grieving their vision. Um, and just these are some signs to look for denial, guilt, anger, depression, sadness, acceptance, um, adjustment to vision, how are they are they coping. Um, I'm going to let you read over this slide yourselves. Um, the slides are, will be um, posted up online uh, after our webinar today. Um, but in many cases, I want you to be aware because you are the primary practitioner. They've seen you, they've come to see you for their vision problem and they may not see someone else for a little while um, regarding uh, their vision. You're really in this perfect position to refer them if you think that they might need counselling. That's both the caregiver and the patient. Um, but your role doesn't just stop there because your positivity and your encouragement is really vital um, in empowering the patient and by providing them tools and tricks, um, like we're gonna discuss in a moment, um, you really empower the patient. And this plays a huge aspect in promoting positive mental health. So I just want you to be aware of uh, the role that you do play in addressing the psychological needs of your low vision patient. Okay, so we've gotten to know our patient. Let's see how we might help them achieve uh, independence in their daily living. This is a summary of things that we're gonna look at today um, in making an environment workable for your patient. So I'll leave this with you just to read over um, when you have a look at the slides. They're usually pretty simple and they're usually actually pretty inexpensive um, tricks and tools. These adaptations uh, not only allow the patient more independence, but it also helps the patient to be a lot safer. Um, for example, the ability to dial a telephone for help. Um, also, uh, a lot of patients, they're not leaving the home alone, um, but they do need to be able to evacuate the home in an emergency without assistance. So by allowing them to have a little bit more um, independence, you're also giving them um, a little bit more, you're also giving them tools to be a little bit safer um, when things don't go as planned. Uh, for example, the patient with the inferior uh, field defect, they also need to be able to safely walk around their home without falling over low objects. 
Um, and so you need to have a chat to them about, um, you wanna make sure that those objects are removed. You wanna make sure that um, people aren't placing objects where they don't belong, um, just to prevent them from falling. It's as important to keep them as independent as it is to keep them safe. So a good way to start is advising your patients to fix up any hazards in the house, like loose carpeting, if there's a rug, maybe um, tacking it down so the person doesn't get their foot caught um, under, the, under the, the lip of the rug and fall over. Um, if there are broken handrails on staircases, make sure they're fixed. Um, for example, the patient who has that inferior field defect, um, maybe installing a handrail um, in on the staircase in the home if there is one um, so they can hold on to it as they're going down the stairs. Non-slip flooring also really important they're not going to see the spills or anything um, that are on the kitchen floor or the bathroom floor and so making sure there's non-slip flooring is really important. I did have one question actually um, that came through this morning about asking like, how, like where do you start with parents and what advice do you give parents um, of uh, with, who have children with low vision? Um, and a lot of parents do say, well, I don't even know where to start. Like, how do, I, how, do I even, how do I even do this? And I think my main advice is not to be too quick to help the child when they're having difficulty. Um, and to let them sort of explore their visual environment and to do things independently, to, to allow them to be a little bit braver and do things independently, even though it may seem from your point of view a little bit scary to let them um, go ahead and, and give that task a shot themselves. Also, I'd like to remind my parents, uh, the parents, just because the child experiences the world differently doesn't mean that there's limitations to what they can do. It just means that they experience the activity slightly differently to what the parent would experience the activity. Um, to start off with, I like to talk to them about helping their child explore the visual environment and uh, the very last, um, in the very last slides of our presentation today, we'll quickly go over that. Um, but also um, being consistent in the order of motions, um, in the surfaces that you use, for example, um, dressing a child on the same surface, so the child feels safe and they and they know what's coming next. They can expect, they know what to expect. So let's start with improving contrast. You want to advise your um, patients to use contrasting colours in pretty much all activities. It makes um, life a lot easier. Even activities as simple as eating, as you can see here. We want patients to avoid using patterned backgrounds such as a flowery or checkered tablecloth. And we want um, them to serve uh, food on plates that are contrasting compared to the food so the patient can find the food on, on their plate. Again, this is advice that you're going to be giving both the caregiver, their family and friends, um, in addition to the patient. So can you imagine um, someone with low, you're someone with low vision and you're confronted with this, eating off that white plate is going to be almost impossible because you can't see the rice on it. So finding that rice is going to be incredibly impossible. Whereas eating from the red plate or the green plate is going to be a little bit easier. Uh, have a think about your own homes. We like to, we love to color coordinate um, at, at home with our floors and benches and, and tables and walls. Um, and we particularly like functional things to blend in um, or to match. And this is really unhelpful for a person with low vision. So if you do need to install a safety rail, making sure that safety rail is um, a different color to the wall that it's attached to. If patients are being served meals, try not to uh, match the tablecloth or the um, placemats with the um, color of the crockery. Uh, your toothbrush, can they find their toothbrush really easily against the background of the white bathroom? Or is the bathroom and, and what it's sitting in also white? So you want your um, patients and your caregivers to start thinking about these things and how they could make these changes. Advise patients the, um, to outline changes in their environment, such as uh, stairs, um, such as going into different rooms. You can, by using uh, tape, you can 
um, highlight, okay, now we're, now I'm stepping into the bathroom. I'm now stepping into the kitchen. Um, you can see going up those stairs a lot safer with those little orange marks. Um, sloping walls, such as the one that I have here behind me, um, putting a mark on um, the wall with tape uh, really helps the patient from hitting their head um, because uh, it doesn't blend in with the background, but it really stands out a lot easier. This is for safety and also direction. Um, if you do have a kid with low vision, um, enhancing uh, your toys um, with coloured tape or markers to provide more contrast. And this you can see I just traced around the puzzles there. Um, so doing something like that is easy with a, with a Sharpie or a marker. Uh, this doesn't just apply to kids' toys. Um, ask your patient what their favourite games are to play at home with family and friends. Do they like playing um, solitaire or cards with their family? Um, do they play games where they've got dice? Uh, you can get a lot of games that are at high contrast um, for vision impaired adults. Also, you can see you could trace around a puzzle um, in a similar sort of way that you would for a child. Obviously, using uh, colour to highlight ceilings and stairs uh, for safety is really important, but also thinking about um, advising your um, patients uh, to get the, the doorways as, um, painted a different colour to the wall so they can identify the doorways as they're approaching them, um, so they can find the light switches, um, getting tape around that edge of the light fixture so they know um, where to go um, to turn the light on and off. Um, also making sure that things that blend in, I think like a, I think a squatting toilet is a really fantastic example of you accidentally popping your foot into the toilet rather than to where you, um, to the side where you, you need to um, rest your foot. And so you want to make sure that they have clear um, edges and so they know where to pop their foot. Also talking about um, Colour, cool, um, separating um, things that look very similar like keys, um, using colour. You can see we've got a pill bottle here, also some different coloured caps for perhaps some um, things that they're using. So making, um, using colour in a way to identify things that look quite similar. Okay, so there's colour and contrast. There's some examples. Um, again, I like to write these kind of things down on a handout so the patient can go home and have a think about with their loved ones um, what they can, what changes they can make and what changes they want to make. Let's have a bit of a chat about lighting. Um, you want to advise your patients to have curtains or blinds on their windows um, if they're suffering from a lot of glare so they can control the level of light in the house during the daytime. Um, you want to uh, perhaps have non-reflective surfaces uh, such as uh, your benches or your work surfaces uh, or you want to cover them with a non-reflective material so uh, you can eliminate the glare coming from overhead lighting coming back up at the patient. Um, if you have a patient who's a student, you want to ask about, well, where are you, are you studying? Where are you working? Um, if they're facing a window, uh, you want to advise them to move that desk so their back is to the window to avoid um, the amount of glare that they're getting from that light. You uh, will also probably be... Um, advising your patients to um, use individual lighting to focus on a specific task. Also, when you're prescribing magnifiers, have a think if a magnifier with an inbuilt light will help or will hinder the patient in their task. Um, often we want to prescribe the magnifier with the inbuilt light because we think, oh, that'll help quite a lot, but show them with and without, and you might actually find that they get um, a lot more vision um, out of the magnifier without that light. So you just want to see what best suits the patient. Encourage uh, your patients and their family to be really, really um, organized, um, both in their homes and in their workspaces and their learning environments. Uh, you want to return things to the same place once you've used them. You want to make sure that you're eliminating clutter and unnecessary items. Uh, you want to reduce the amount of visual clutter. 
So you can see here on, on this open shelf, that's a lot of information for someone with low vision to take in and perhaps not something that they need to, need to see. Um, so by covering the shelf of the unit with a solid cloth, it really reduces the amount of visual clutter for the patient. Family members will want to help the school team um, organize the classroom. Um, and one way of doing this also at home is by dividing it according to subject areas, such as music, um, table work, coloring, snack areas. Um, you want to use rugs um, and furniture that are brightly colored and, and usually like very solid colors rather than um, being a bit of everything. Um, to help divide these areas up so the patient can identify where they need to go next. And you want to make sure that they can arrange the furniture in a way that it's easy and safe for the patient to move around the classroom. Um, also, you want to make sure that they're not regularly moving furniture, particularly without the patient knowing, because they're likely to have a visual map of what the classroom looks like and then you don't want them running into things that they're not expecting. Um, and you want to have designated places for toys and for objects and things that they're about to use so they know exactly where to go to get them. Separating activities into groups is a really fantastic way um, to make a patient feel a lot uh, safer and a lot more confident in their environment. This even applies uh, to eating um, where a patient can easily identify which food they want to eat next um, by having it separated always in the same in the same way. Uh, you're going to want to pass on a lot of this advice uh, to teachers, um, particularly um, teachers who are teaching uh, kids in a mainstream school environment. Kids, they spend a lot of time in this environment and it's really important for them to thrive at school just because they're low they've got low vision doesn't mean they can't thrive academically and you want them to feel comfortable during these learning tasks and to get the most out of them. So you might want to um, arrange a sit down with the teacher and the parents um, as well, or um, you can write a letter or you can send that same sort of list and but maybe tailor to classroom learning um, that the patients um, parents can give to the teachers. Sounds are a really great way of uh, helping a patient navigate their environment. Um, <clears throat> we can use sound to indicate where things are in the environment um, or if we want to read things. Um, some examples of this is when the cup is full, so you can see uh, over to the left of the screen there, there is a small um, device that's placed on the cup and as the water comes up the side when it hits the um, when it hits the device then it makes a beeping sound when it hits the sensor and so the patient knows to turn the tap off or to stop pouring into the cup otherwise it's going to overflow. Um, we have talking clocks you can press the clock and it says it is currently 417. We have talking tape measures that will um, to tell you how uh, what the exact measurement is so you don't have to read it. Um, we also have these uh, talking readers where you can uh, scan something that it identifies. Um, for example, this is scanning the yellow marker um, and it will say that it's the yellow marker or it might say if you've programmed it, some of them you can program them and it can say it is um, whatever medication and it'll help patients identify things um, within their homes that they've labeled. Um, balls, I think that's, I think they're very cool. You can buy balls, tennis balls, cricket balls, um, basketballs with um, ball bearings or something inside them that when they're moving, they're making noise. And this helps the patient catch a ball because they can hear where the ball is within the environment and they can hear it coming towards them. Advise your patients to make everyday items in large print. Um, that's homework, recipes, calendars, measuring cups. Um, you want to be able to magnify specifically the um, magnify the writing on the medication bottles. Um, you've got timers, kitchen timers here. You've got large print games such as Sudoku, word puzzles. Um, you've got super large boggle here. Um, 
super large high contrast cards. These are bingo cards at the top. You've got um, large mahjong tiles. Uh, so if your patient, ask your patient what games or what things, activities they like to play with their family. If they say, look, I, I used to really enjoy mahjong, then say, look, you can actually get large mahjong tiles for you to um, continue playing that, or you can continue playing um, Scrabble or, or Monopoly with your family. Also keyboards and phones, um, they can, all of these can be sourced pretty easily um, in large print and high contrast. So you've got some things that just go over the top of your laptop keyboard and you've got other things that um, you specifically buy the phone or the keyboard um, to attach to your main computer uh, that has larger, um, a larger print on the, on the keyboards. Labeling, ask your patient's caregiver to label all the useful items. This can be done in high contrast, um, large print labeling. It can also be done in braille if your patient um, is going to learn uh, braille. Um, this is particularly useful if they're young. You can see on the top left hand corner, that's a label maker for, um, for braille, which is very cool. You can see it's labeling here possibly something that looks like maybe the uh, dishwasher, the on and off button. Um, also, these things don't have to be particularly expensive. Even just by um, tying a rubber band or a ribbon around something can help um, your patients easily identify that it's theirs. Advise caregivers to label clothing and clothing drawers so the patient can independently dress themselves and they're gonna match. Texture, um, you may not actually have been aware of this and I, I wasn't until um, I became an optometrist, but um, often the sidewalks, there's a lot of uh, textured markings on the sidewalks to help those with low vision um, navigate uh, their way around, um, around the sidewalks and they know when to stop and they know when to, how, which way is straight, which way is forward. Uh, so advise your uh, patients and their, and their loved ones to walk um, the patient's route to school, to the shops, um, to work and see what cues are available, what tactile sim symbols and signs are available on their way um, to that place. And they'll help the patient gain a little bit more confidence um, on the way, even if they are using a guide to get there, um, it, they'll still feel a lot more comfortable if they know whereabouts they are on that, um, on that route by feeling that cue. Um, back to like games and things like that. Um, texture plays a, a big role um, in making games accessible to patients. Um, you can get Uno with Braille, uh, dice that um, are textured. Uh, you can get uh, Monopoly, um, Scrabble pieces, or I think this is Bananagram um, pieces where patients can feel the tiles. Uh, patients can buy watches um, that have tactile um, clock faces. Some are quite fancy and some are pretty, pretty standard, depends on what suits the patient best. Um, they can also, they can buy so many things uh, where, that are adapted for low vision. You can see here, this is a, a map of the United States that perhaps the student is using to learn um, about the United States um, and it's raised so they can feel around um, the areas and where the capital cities are. Uh, you have a tape measure here that has little eyelets at the half inch point um, and you have someone who's measuring here but they can feel the points at which, um, at which the centimetres um, come along. Uh, we had a question this morning about writing and this is um, I would say by far the most requested activity after reading. Um, you want to get your patients to use large, clear, clearly lined paper. They can even buy paper like this, or obviously they can get, they can make it themselves if their family and, and friends are, are willing. Um, also, when they're writing, you would advise them to use a high contrast pen as well, um, because you want them to be able to see clearly um, what they're writing. You can also have writing guides down the bottom here. They can help a patient write a letter, um, 
something that we don't often think about, but filling out the envelope of the letter, um, also filling out and signing a check um, if they want to pay by check. So these are, they come in all different shapes and sizes and they can help um, patients navigate the things that they like, that they'd like to write. Technology, uh, using technology as a visual aid has been covered in previous lectures on CyberSign um, by, I think by Nicole or um, Lexi. Um, but I just want you to be um, aware of how we can adapt the technology and the visual aids to assist your patient in just everyday activities, not just reading and writing, which seems to be sort of the main focus. So you can see uh, this lady here is using um, one of her aids to put her makeup on. You can see the, this other lady is uh, using one of her aids to look um, at the, a photo of her grandchildren, presumably. So um, encourage them to explore what they can do with these. There are so many helpful gadgets. <laughs> You've got um, here an automatic uh, needle threader, which I think is really cool. Um, also, you have a very cool um, light box um, where uh, you can organize everything that you need in one place and you can use it either as a light or a light box depending on the activity that the patient needs to do. Uh, constantly spilling food and water um, is, a, is a very common thing um, that we hear. Um, it can be extremely embarrassing for patients getting food and water all over themselves and also over the table. On the right, we have a spill not carrier, and this assists patients walking from one room to another um, with uh, a cup of water without spilling. And we also have a plate mate spill guard, and this provides a border that both provides a guide for where the edge of the plate is, but also prevents the, the spilling of food. I've just popped down the bottom there um, where you can buy them, I think on things like Amazon and stuff like that. But there's lots of little things like this. So to end today, we're going to quickly talk about um, orientation and mobility, and we've got probably about sort of 10 to 15 minutes. <clears throat> so orientation um, refers to um, how you and other people or other objects are positioned within the space. Um, and mobility refers to the confidence and the capacity um, of moving around within that space. Many patients uh, walk with a cane. Many patients also uh, reject um, walking with a cane. Uh, this is obviously not something that you will teach yourselves. You will send um, people off to um, have training uh, with someone, whoever um, practices um, low vision and orientation and mobility in your community. If, if you don't have someone like that in your community, um, then you could easily uh, get training in this area so you can teach patients this yourself. Even if you're not teaching them yourself, it is a, you are a vital aspect to them picking this skill up. Obviously, you're going to um, probably be the person who refers them, but also your encouragement is quite vital for them to seek out this, um, this skill and this um, service and this advice. Also, encouraging them that there's nothing wrong with using a cane. I've heard so many patients that they're really hesitant because they say, oh no, I couldn't possibly learn that skill. It looks far too hard. Um, or I don't want to be identified by other people as being visually impaired when I'm out. And it really um, comes down to you convincing them that no, this is actually okay for you to walk around with a cane. It's quite easy for you to learn. It will take time, but it's something that we um, are confident that you will pick up. Um, and it's okay for you to be identified as low vision. It's uh, safe. People will know um, not to, to take care when they're around you. And so really a lot of encouragement from yourself um, is vital to them um, taking this skill on board. It really does provide patients a lot of confidence and independence. This is something that, we, that uh, we're we gonna cover that you can teach um, quickly in your exam room. Um, you wanna make sure, you, probably most likely the main caregiver will be there, but you, this is something that you wanna teach the main caregiver. Often patients will come in um, with their carers and, and you'll notice they have some type of method similar to this um, that they've 
sort of informally devised between themselves um, as the patient is being helped into the exam room. Take note of this. Um, how do they do this um, and is it efficient? It's always worth, even if it seems that they have a, uh, something in place, it's always worth teaching family members how to guide properly. Um, there's a few things. It actually gives the person a lot more control rather than being dragged along. They have the ability to stop and let go if they're feeling uncomfortable um, when they're being guided properly. It also gives them a lot more confidence because they have a, a lot more spatial um, information that they're getting um, rather than just being dragged along because um, they can feel uh, your movements as the guider. Um, also, they're free to walk along more naturally. So it seems a little bit more socially appropriate um, and it is a lot more respectful. Um, so first of all, you're gonna tell the carer that you want them to hold their, um, the back of their hand out and to touch the back of their hand to the back of the um, patient's hand. And so then the patient can easily find uh, the, uh, the, the guide's elbow. Uh, in some cases, your, uh, they're gonna hold them perhaps to a wrist or a finger if they're uh, a lot shorter, such as a child. You wanna make sure, you wanna tell the guide that they'll be about a step or a step a half ahead of the person and that the person is holding on to the elbow, making sure that the guide keeps their elbow at 90 degrees so it's nice and stable and that it's close to their body so the, um, the person who's being guided um, can get some information about um, where they are spatially. Um, you wanna make sure that they're maintaining communication constantly and that they're using specific language. Like there's a small curb in front of you now it's time to step up um, or the door on your left to you is closed rather than watch out or be careful. <laughs> That's not really helpful. It's very stressful in this situation. So you want to make sure that they use language like to the right of you or right in, in front of you. Uh, there's a curb, there's a step, it's small, it's large and that they're being quite specific. So the person being guided is empowered. Um, when you're moving um, through a doorway, uh, you want to uh, pop your guided arm behind your back in the small of your back there. And what that allows is the patient, uh, indicates to the patient that you want them to walk directly behind you. So like in a single file. Um, so they'll do that still holding onto your elbow. Um, when you're walking through a door, if it's possible, you want them to be on the hinge side of the door and so that you might um, ask them and give them a moment to swap um, to your other elbow. So they're on the other side. Um, and then of course, once you're through the door, uh, then you're going to, um, they're gonna go back to their original position. Um, if they're on the hinge side of the door, what they'll most likely do is they'll be holding onto your elbow, following single file, and then they'll reach out to the door and touch the door and they'll be able to close the door behind them. So you're not then backtracking to close the door. Um, when you're guiding someone upstairs, you want to make sure that you stop at the first step, that you stand alongside them as the guide, um, and you let the patient know what's about to happen. For example, the handrail is located to your right. Um, there are seven steps, uh, other steps going up or down. They want to know if they're stepping up or down. Um, and you want to know when uh, you're about to start and when they get to the last step as well. If you're guiding someone to a chair, you wanna make sure you place their hand on the back of the chair or the, or the handrail of the chair, um, just so they know and, and advise them that um, I'm about to pop your hand on the, on the um, chair rest, on your right hand onto the right chair rest. Um, also, when you're walking through a doorway, you want to, um, I think, sorry, I forgot to say, you want to um, tell them which direction the door is going to open as well. When you're teaching these skills, do you think about what's um, culturally um, and socially normal um, or, um, or what's uh, culturally inappropriate, such as men and women walking together or something like that? You want to be a little bit more mindful of those things. 
Lastly, in the last five minutes, um, we're just going to talk about helping a patient navigate their environment. Um, obviously, they'll need to scan this environment. Um, this is a very small aspect um, of vision. Um, I'm going to throw out a rhetorical question. Um, does anyone have any idea what this is? Um, it's a very small um, uh, amount of information. Um, so they're going to want to scan this environment, but in regular environments, we also want people um, to get to know the environment and their, their caregivers are going, to be are going to be responsible for helping them explore this environment. And they're going to be responsible for helping them um, visually navigate the environment. So how about now? It doesn't really make any, it doesn't really help at all with the blur that's surrounding it. Um, and scanning this visual field um, even slowly would be very confronting. So it's a playground. Now imagine there's children running around and uh, lots of noise. Uh, you can see that this would be incredibly scary um, from a patient's point of view. So you're going to teach them just to stop and to break down the information. So zoom in zip it all together and zoom out. Oops, sorry. So you want to teach the person how to use one single section to start off with. So uh, this is the slide, this is how you get on, this is how you go down, this is um, where it ends, and you keep repeating and teach them about this section until they're really comfortable. And then you learn about the section next to it. This is the green ladder that goes from the floor. Um, these are the green steps that go up and down. When you're brave enough, the yellow pole to slide down. And when they've really explored that area, then the patient is able to, I guess, essentially zip these things together and zoom out. So they're going to create a visual map and have a complete understanding of the playground by having um, very clear knowledge of each individual section, they have a little bit better a map of the whole playground. So when they're approaching the playground and there are lots of children running around them, they're feeling a little bit more confident about what they're wa are walking towards. When they're scanning, they know what they're scanning for. So um, that's all from me today. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. I'd just like to finish off by saying that really, no activity is prohibited. If you um, are um, fit enough to complete the activity, then your vision um, shouldn't stand in the way of you doing that. Um, a really great question is, or well, how can I continue my sport? So it's good to ask patients, what were you doing before this um, for exercise? And they might say, so I really used to love skiing. And you can see that they're still fit enough to really enjoy that. Um, and so you can connect them with a, a club um, that has a, um, a guide um, and knows how to help um, visually um, impaired or partially sighted um, people uh, ski. Um, you can see this is someone who is rowing, they're rowing with someone who um, is um, a guide and um, making sure that they're going in the, in the correct way. You've got a partially sighted um, rugby team here and a lot of people um, still run and they still run marathons and they do this with their guides. So really the, the biggest obstacle standing in the way of your patient's independence and getting back to the regular activities prior to their visual impairment is their confidence and building their confidence and giving them some ideas and referring them off to people who can help but also you being one of the people that helps them it really does start with you. It starts with you because you are the primary um, eye care practitioner. So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. I think we're going to, I think we do have time for some questions. So um, I'm not going to talk about uh, low vision devices um, and the advancement in low vision devices, um, but that is a really uh, Good question. We had a, a lot of questions like that come in this morning. Um, I'm going to have a chat um, to our team at CyberSight and see what we can um, what we can address something like that in in a, another webinar. Um, but please do sign up and ask questions like this um, on our um, on our community um, page um, so we can answer them for you. Um, I love this actually. Someone said, "Are there any examples of like?" Um, Alexa or Google or Siri helping um, 
low vision patients. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that's a fantastic idea. That's a really good thing to um, advise patients to get. So someone's asking about central vision loss here um, and what is one of the um, issues in terms of daily living. Um, have a little bit of a think about this person with central vision, even just thinking about uh, filling up a cup. They're going to be watching this cup um, directly. And so you're going to want to teach them eccentric fixation and things like that, but also helping them incorporate devices um, be mindful that obviously your peripheral vision isn't as clear as your central vision. And so you want to make sure that, for example, you're putting tape on like the edges of walls here and things like that. So people aren't knocking their head. They do have that peripheral vision that's intact, um, but it's maybe not as clear. So they won't identify subtle changes in contrast. Um, so you want to make sure that they are taking advantage of all the things that we discussed today. Just really, really simple things. Um, to make navigating their environment a lot a lot easier. There are all the things, they're all the ones that I'm going to answer today. There are a few questions in there that we'll answer privately um, that are a little bit more specific um, to uh, new devices and magnifiers. Um, like I said, please, please, please get online, join our community, join the discussion, um, particularly if you have difficult patient cases. Um, often well, you and I might work through a case and then I'll say, look, I think this is a really interesting case, something that a lot of people have probably experienced with their patients. Could we make it public? Um, and if you agree and the patient agrees, um, then uh, we'll make the case public so other people can learn from it making sure when you're posting things up that you do de-identify patient information so you're not breaking any HIPAA rules or anything like that. So if that is all of our questions for today, all done for today. <laughs>